On the same day, in fact, possibly at the same time, a meeting took place between Mrs. Stavrogin and Mr. Verkovinsky. She had decided to see him a long time before and had informed her former friend of that fact, but somehow she had kept postponing it until then. They met at Skvorishniki. Mrs. Stavrogin arrived at her country house in a bustle. The day before it had finally been decided that the reception was to be held in the headland owner's house. But the quick-witted Mrs. Stavrogin had immediately realized that nothing could prevent her from giving her own special party at Skvorishniki afterward and inviting the whole town. Then they could decide for themselves which was the better house and who received with better taste and organized a better ball. Indeed, she was almost unrecognizable these days. She seemed to have undergone a metamorphosis from the unapproachable supreme lady as Mr. Verkovinsky described her, to just another whimsical society woman. But this may have been only a superficial impression. When she arrived at the empty country house, she inspected the rooms, accompanied by her faithful old footman, Alexei, and by Foma, a specialist in interior decoration and in general, a man of experience. They discussed what furniture and paintings should be brought from the townhouse, where these things should be placed, what flowers should be brought from the hot house, and how they should be arranged, where to hang the curtains, where the bar should be, whether there should be only one or two buffets, and so on. And suddenly, in the middle of all these worries and preoccupations, she decided to send the carriage for Mr. Verkovinsky. Mr. Verkovinsky, who had been warned long before of the forthcoming meeting, had been expecting something like this every day, so he was ready for the sudden invitation. On getting into the carriage, he crossed himself, because for him, this was the moment of decision. He found his former friend in the main drawing room, sitting on a small couch in a recess, Before her stood a small marble table and pencil in hand. She was jotting down something on a sheet of paper. Foma was measuring the windows and the height of the gallery and Mrs. Stavrogin was taking down the figures and making notes in the margins. Without stopping her writing, she nodded in Mr. Verkovinsky's direction and when he muttered some form of greeting, she hurriedly proffered him her hand and, without looking up, pointed to a spot next to her inviting him to sit down. That's so good, I'm gonna look in another one and check out one of the other translations. So that was the Andrew R. McAndrew. Now I'm gonna look in the, um, this one is David McGarshak. All right, I admit I can't find it at this time, so we'll continue. I'm going to reread that because it was quite beautiful. Mr. Verkovinsky, who had been warned long before of the forthcoming meeting, had been expecting something like this every day, so he was ready for the sudden invitation. On getting into the carriage, he crossed himself because for him, this was the moment of decision. He found his former friend in the main drawing room, sitting on a small couch in a recess. Before her stood a small marble table and pencil in hand. She was jotting down something on a sheet of paper. Foma was measuring the windows in the height of the gallery, 
and Mrs. Stavrogin was taking down the figures and making notes in the margins. Without stopping her writing, she nodded in Mr. Verkovinsky's direction, and when he muttered some form of greeting, she hurriedly proffered him her hand and, without looking up, pointed to a spot next to her, inviting him to sit down. All right, I'm going to go looking for it again because I do want to read. Prepare, so it's chapter five, okay. Chapter All right, here we go. This is from the Magar Shack translation. That last one was from Andrew R. McAndrew. Almost at the same time, that is to say on the same day, the interview between Mr. Verkovinsky and Mrs. Stavrogin took place at last. Mrs. Stavrogin had long been thinking about it and had informed her former friend about it. But for some reason, she kept putting it off. It took place at Skvorshniki. Mrs. Stavrogin arrived at her country house full of bustling activity. The day before, it was finally decided that the fete would be given at the house of the marshal's wife. But Mrs. Stavrogin, with her quick brain, at once realized that there was nothing to prevent her afterwards from holding her own fete in Skvorshniki, to which the whole town would again be invited. Then everyone would be able to see for themselves whose house was best and where people could count on a better reception and where a ball was given with better taste. In general, it was impossible to recognize her. She looked quite a different woman and seemed to have been transformed from an unapproachable high society lady, Mr. Verkovinsky's expression, to a most ordinary feather-brained society woman. However, that may have only seemed so. <laughs> And here's the uh, last paragraph that we just read twice in McAndrew. And now this is McGarshack. Having arrived at her empty country house, she went through all the rooms in the company of her faithful old butler, Alexei Yegorich, and Foma, a man of wide experience of affairs and a specialist in interior decorations. They started discussing plans, what furniture to bring from the townhouse, what things and what pictures, where to put them, how best to arrange the flowers, and which flowers to get from the hothouses, where to hang the curtains, where to have the buffet, and should they have one or two buffets, etc., etc. And it was while thus busily engaged that she suddenly took it into her head to send a carriage for Mr. Verkovinsky. This is actually the paragraph that we just read twice, this next one. Mr. Verkovinsky had long before been warned about his coming visit and was ready, expecting to receive such a sudden invitation any day, as he got into the carriage, he crossed himself. His fate was being decided. He found his friend in the big drawing room, sitting on a small sofa in the recess in front of a small marble table, a paper and pencil in her hands. Fomo was measuring the height of the gallery in the windows, while Mrs. Stavrogin herself was putting down the figures and making notes on the margin. She nodded to Mr. Verkovinsky without interrupting her work, and when... The latter murmured a greeting. She gave him her hand hurriedly and, without looking, motioned him to a seat beside her. I sat there waiting for five minutes, suppressing my feelings, he told me afterwards. The woman I saw was not the woman I had known for twenty years. The utter conviction that everything was at an end lent me a strength that surprised even her. I swear to you. She was astonished by my steadfastness in that last hour. I'm going to uh, now go to the other translation I have right here. 
Pavir and Volokonsky. Give me a minute.